Greetings, everyone. My name is Dan Carpenter, and I am Director of Social Sciences Academic Ventures at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. We are thrilled that today's lecture is part of Hub Week, which, if you're not familiar with it, is an ambitious civic collaboration between the Boston Globe, MIT, Mass General Hospital, and Harvard that showcases innovation and creativity. The commitment to ideas and discovery that Hub Week celebrates is at the core of Radcliffe's dual mission. First, to support innovative research and creative work that cuts across disciplines. And second, to share that work with the public through a packed calendar of events such as this one. I also want to extend uh, uh, an acknowledgement to the many reunion uh, classes who are here this week. We are celebrating several fall reunions. And so a special welcome to the members of the classes of 1972, 1977, and 1987 who are with us here today. I'd like to highlight a few of the upcoming events that might be of particular interest to you. You can find complete details on our calendar cards, which are available at the back of the room and at the registration table downstairs, or you can find them online at radcliffe.harvard.edu. First, each year, Radcliffe holds a major science symposium in the fall. This year's symposium, entitled Contagion, Exploring Modern Epidemics, will investigate new ways to understand, track, and respond to epidemic diseases, as well as social epidemics. That symposium will take place here in the Knopfel Center on Friday, October 27th. Next Monday, October 16th, a closely related lecture series on epidemics will kick off with a talk called Epide Epidemiology Counts on Causes, Consequences, and Healthy Populations by Boston University School of Public Health Dean Sandro Galea. Dean Galea will discuss the complexity of how we measure the health of a population and how we determine which of the factors influencing health matters the most. And finally, we are looking forward to welcoming historian Michael Kazin, a distinguished scholar of American politics and social movements and editor of the magazine, Dissent. He will give a lecture entitled, Does the Left Have a Future? Here in the Knopfel Center on Thursday, November 2nd. I hope you will be able to join us. Finally, let me invite you all to a reception to continue the conversation following this talk Immediately after the Q&A session this afternoon, the reception will take place right next door on the first floor of Agassiz House. After the talk from uh, Julie Guthman, uh, there will be a question and answer session at which there will be a standing mic placed in the center of the center aisle. Please identify yourself, uh, form a line, identify yourself before you ask a question. And now, let me introduce today's speaker. Julie Guthman is a professor of social sciences at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and the Francis B. Cashin Fellow here at Radcliffe. Her research has focused on how neoliberal inflected capitalism shapes possibilities for food system transformation. As a Radcliffe Fellow, Guthman is writing a book that traces how the soil pathogen Verticillium dalliae gave rise to the technologies and institutions that brought the California strawberry industry success, yet at the same time, locked in a system of production that renders less intensive methods nearly unviable. Today, Guthman will discuss the origins and development of the alternative food movement and how it came to focus on market-based alternatives, as well as how the movement has evolved in response to critiques for instance, that it has done little to undermine industrially produced food and has struggled to resonate with poor people and communities of color. Guthman hold, holds a PhD in geography from the University of California, Berkeley. She has won four different book awards, including the Frederick, Frederick H. Buttle uh, Outstanding Scholarly Achievement Award from the Rural Sociological Society for her book, Agrarian Dreams, The Paradox of Organic Farming in California as well as the ASFS Book Award for Weighing In, Obesity, Food Justice, and the Limits of Capitalism. She is also a recipient of the Agriculture, Food, and Human Values Society's Excellence in Scholarship Award, and her research has received funding from the National Science Foundation, 
as, and, as well as being uh, herself a resident fellow of the Rockefeller Foundation Bellagio Center and the University of California Humanities Research Institute. I will also add she is a 2017 Guggenheim Fellow. Finally, let me underscore as a way of thanking our friends and supporters at Radcliffe that Julie is this year the Francis B. Cashin Fellow and her fellowship is generously supported by Richard M. Cashin and Elizabeth S. Cashin, class of 75, both. And finally, a personal note. Um, I uh, had a wonderful uh, and enjoyable dinner conversation with Julie last night, um, and I learned a lot about her work, uh, her family, uh, her food habits, which are far more tasteful than mine. Uh, we discussed many issues in the news which have been rather depressing and which I won't alight upon here, but I found her insights at every stage to be profoundly thoughtful and creatively expressed. I am honored and excited to have a new colleague in Julie, and I ask you to extend her a warm welcome. Hi there, and thank you, Dan, for that really kind introduction. I appreciate it. And really thank all of you for coming today. Um, it is truly an honor and a privilege to be here at the Radcliffe Institute, and I am deeply grateful to the work of Dean Cohen, Associate Dean Vishniak, and their truly superlative staff in keeping things ticking. And I'm especially honored to be invited to speak here during Boston Hub Week and Harvard Reunion Week. That's all to the good. Now the bad news is I came down with a cold, and so you will have to excuse my particularly gravelly voice today and literal throat clearing. And now for the figurative throat clearing of my talk. So I want to begin with the 2014 New York Times column penned by noted food writer Mark Bittman. In this column, Bittman described having a negative visceral reaction to the word foodie. Foodies, he argued, are too often new style epicures who enjoy watching competitive cooking shows, doing anything to get a table at the trendy restaurant, scouring the web for single estate faro, I've not done that one, or devoting oneself to finding the best food truck. If and when these foodies go beyond the pursuit of pleasure, he noted they tend to put their energies into consumer support for sustainable food systems, such as the purchase of organic and local foods, participating in community-supported agriculture projects, or buying at farmers markets. This, he suggested, was not quite enough. He went on to say that making good food fair and affordable cannot be achieved without going beyond food to address questions of justice and equality and rights, of enhancing rather than restricting democracy, of making a more rational, legitimate economy. Now, as it happens, Bittman's column borrowed a critique that I and other scholars in conversation with activists have been making for a very long time. We have argued that many foodies and food activists focus on consumption has overemphasized relatively apolitical market-based strategies such as patronizing and creating alternative food businesses. We have pointed out that these strategies have been embraced and promoted by those who are generally well off and white. We have suggested that attempts by foodies and food activists to shift the public's eating habits toward the notions of good food have too often been encased in a politics of conversion. The attempts to change individual eating habits without understanding the multiple circumstances, pressures, and desires 
that inform food choices. It's a classic missionary position, if you will. <laughs> and we've claimed that food activism, in focusing on consuming good food, has taken the focus off the conditions of food production, particularly neglecting the needs of those who work in the food system. Indeed, as building positive alternatives has become the nearly sole activity of the food movement, food producers and processors have been effectively let off the hook for their harmful practices. Little, that is, has been done to undermine the conventional food system. Now, in making these critiques, we have both angered and inspired food activists. Some have suggested that these critiques are disempowering. Some have said they've known them all along and didn't feel they could voice them. And some have been motivated to rethink what they do. So today, I want to do three things aside from shameless promotion for my new co-edited book. I want to talk about the origins and development of the food movement as a way to explain how it became about market-based alternatives, often at the expense of social justice. I want to show, secondly, I want to show how it evolved in response to critiques such as ours. And that note, I want to suggest that these critiques have been generative and not necessarily disempowering. Um, and they have led to more inclusion or attempts at inclusion of social justice concerns. And then I want to briefly discuss three cases that reflect this new food activism focusing on a battle, one of which focuses on a battle that motivated my current research um, and led to my project here at Radcliffe. Alas, I won't be discussing my Radcliffe project today, but I would be delighted to answer questions about it at the end. And I will then conclude by talking about the challenges and opportunities of the current moment. And it is a challenging current moment. First, I want to be clear on what food movement I'm referring to. After all, various forms of food activism have been around for a very long time. So I want to discuss what many refer to as the alternative food movement. And I begin with the organic farming movement because it was so clearly a progenitor of this market-based approach to food system transformation. Now, in the slide, the person on the left is unknown to me, but the person on the right is Alan Chadwick. Chadwick came to my university, University of California, Santa Cruz, in 1967 in, and began the famed UCSC Organic Farm and Garden, which now has cr created many, many farmers around the world, once worked or trained at, this, at the UCSC farm. And this, his approach was based on the French intensive biodynamic gardening, le biodynamic gardening. Now, there's legend that he and the students used to farm naked. Um, <laughs> I'm fairly willing to believe it, and I do know that there's a few UCSC alums in the audience today, and I bet that they would probably believe it as well. Um, but I actually want to start my story a few years later, and that's in 1973. And I use 1973 as a watershed because that's when a group of, of farmers, primarily um, from California and Oregon, and here I'm talking about the US, of course, here's when they began codifying organic agriculture. In so doing, they, they developed a novel way to regulate agriculture without the support of the government. In the minds of many organic farmers at the time, the US Department of Agriculture and all the other regulatory agencies that might be involved in agriculture had utterly failed to support an agriculture that would conserve soils and reduce the use of toxic chemicals. 
So the original organic farmers opted instead to share the te techniques they had learned and call what they did organically grown. Now there's longer origins of or organic farming that I'm not gonna go into today. But at this point, their, their goal was to give organic farming meaning in the marketplace. So as the organic uh, name began to have cachet, organic farmers needed a, to find a way to guarantee to consumers that their, purchase were, their purchases were indeed organically grown. And every once in a while, there would be some sort of public scare over the incorrect or, or excessive use of a pesticide. And consumers would clamor for organics. And so many producers would respond by becoming organic overnight, in other words, by faking it, um, or so, uh, claiming that they were organic. And uh, understandably, the real organic farmers didn't like that. So they wanted to come up with a system in which they would decide what would be called organic and, and, and make sure that other or these new, uh, newly arrived organic farmers followed the rules. And so these farmers wanted to come up with um, a, a set of what inputs and practices would be allowable in an organic system. Now, now at first, this is, these are just in, uh, organic inspectors. At first, the rules they developed were very simple. Legend goes that they were written on a half, uh, half a page of paper. But the guiding principles they used were generally about that whether the materials that would be allowed in an organic farm were natural and not synthetic. Now, that turned out to be a highly contentious distinction. Um, but that's a discussion for another day, or I'm happy to answer questions about uh, the organic rules during the Q&A. But these guys also figured out it wasn't enough just, just to set standards. It wasn't enough to decide which, which materials would be allowable in organic production systems. They had to find a way to guarantee that growers would follow the rules. So they came up with a system of peer review. Is existing organic farmers would inspect new farms to see if these new farmers were farming in keeping with these organic principles. If these farms, if they decided that they were, these peer review inspectors would certify the farms as organic. Again, another legend, or not so much a legend, this is, you know, this was come, came down with many interviews I conducted years ago. At first, certification was based on a system of, you know it when you see it. Today, organic certification is much, much more complex. There are Baroque review processes for the materials alone, um, and there's hundreds and hundreds, thousands of materials that are reviewed every year to see if they would meet, you know, meet the basic distinction of natural, not synthetic, not toxic. And now, you know, there's huge volumes that now contain the, uh, the list of allowable materials or disallowed materials. Mm -hmm. Today, there are hundreds of certific agent, certification agencies run by states, non-government organizations, and private businesses as well. And these guys all certify farmers. And in the United States, this is all overseen by the federal government although the federal government itself is not in the business of actually certifying farmers. Now, there's a lot more to say about organic rules and certification and whether they work effectively to ensure the integrity of organic practices. But the point I want to make today is actually quite different. Because regardless of the complications involved, this was a system that, in its essence, was supposed to reward good behavior. Producers that wanted to enter the organic sector would agree to abide by a set of rules and pay the costs of certification. And in doing so, they expected to be rewarded, and they expected to be rewarded with a price premium for their efforts. 
Now, this system made sense at the time. I don't think, you know, the, the, these growers went out to come up with a system that wouldn't work. I think they just kind of, it, it's evolved. But it turns out the approach had its drawbacks. And drawbacks that really didn't become evident until organics entered the mainstream. So one consequence of this approach is that, that it allowed significant co-optation. Organic farmers were fetching very high prices for their produce for a while, particularly in the 1980s. Um, but as the organic sector grew, some farmers began to lose out on the price premiums due to intense competition as many new entrants came about, including, I mean, Walmart, or uh, uh, companies like Walmart would bring new organic farmers in. They would often would work with conventional farmers convince them to, to grow organically for them because they actually thought that these conventional farmers knew how to grow better than the original organic farmers and would be more reliable. Um, so what happened is that farmers who want, that wanted to take advantage of the high prices or that were asked to grow um, organically on behest of the, the Walmarts or the Whole Foods or whatever, you know, the, the um, Mountain People's Warehouse that was a distributor, those guys all ask organers, uh, those guys all ask growers to grow organically. And so what um, these farmers, you know, kind of came into it based on that, that kind of market demand, but they weren't committed to incorporating the agroecological principles. And so what they would do is kind of substitute allowable organic inputs for disallowed ones. So they'd enter if there was an input that was, you could easily substitute. And, they, and that means that there was more entry in some crops than others. So the, the point here is that they, they didn't really fully embrace the integrated systems that organic farming was founded on. Now, the original organic farmers, understandably, didn't like this, nor did others who had hoped for more, who had hoped that organic would mean everything that was different, that wanted to be completely different than the conventional food system. So growers in the Northeast, for example, were unhappy to see organic produce shipped from California in their markets. And I myself was surprised shopping at the Whole Foods at Fresh Pond to see organic kale from California in September. I mean, if you can't grow organic kale in Massachusetts in September, I don't know. <laughs> so, and it wasn't very good shipped, I have to tell you. Um, so as organic stopped being effective in supporting the small farmers that birthed the movement, it gave rise to many beyond organic ideas, including locally grown, including fair trade, and many others. Now these new labels were in part to address the social issues that the organic standard had pretty much neglected. They were also designed to support higher prices for farmers with the expectation that these high prices would enable growers to incorporate ecological principles or perhaps pay workers better or otherwise just stay in business. But the thing about these standards is they serve as barriers to entry. They are purposefully difficult to meet to ensure the integrity of each of these labels. And they're, they're difficult to prevent that quick and easy entry that those organic farmers once saw. But this became a major point of contention for the organic movement or industry. On the one hand, high standards are good. They can ensure that a labeled food is truly different. On the other hand, high standards can work against broader transformation by keeping producers out. And this is what the, the conventional growers moving into organics would always sell to me. They, they told us they wanted to feed the world with organics. Why are they making it hard for us? And the fact is, they did make it hard for them because despite all the attention that's given to organics, all the talk about it, and that it putatively grows 20% of uh, per year, only 1% of US farmland is currently in organic production. 
which is a fairly, it's a stunningly low figure. Furthermore, by rewarding only these, only producers who use good practices, those with the bad practices remained unconscionably underregulated. Conventional producers could still use highly toxic materials and inputs, and this food would necessarily be cheaper. Which also means that the system of regulation put the cost burden on the good practices for consumers. Those consumers who valued the qualities that adhere in these labels, um, and it, if they valued them, they'd have to pay more for them. So organic and its cognates, in other words, became more costly by design. So that necessarily created, created a problem of affordability. And so that led to some new social movement attempts. One of the first after this kind of organic and local was community food security. The community food security movement emphasize that both growers and consumers would do better economically if they cut out the middle person. It, they, it, so it put a great deal of emphasis on direct marketing arrangements, farmers markets, community supported agriculture, where supposedly both consumers and producers would benefit, although certainly not the workers who work in distribution companies. In practice, though, that particular win-win didn't happen. So some markets were organized to ensure high prices for farmers by price fixing or limiting who would participate in that market. Now, the market pictured here is Ferry Plaza in San Francisco, renowned for its beautiful but crazily expensive produce. Now, there, a lot of farmers' markets have sprung up that were not so restricted, um, and they do produce, uh, provide cheaper produce for consumers, but the farmers at these markets wouldn't do as well. And I've talked to many farmers who would refuse to sell at the markets that weren't the high-end markets because they knew they couldn't get good prices. There were additional issues. Scholars and activists recognized that nutritious food defined in less rarefied terms than local and organic, was lacking in many urban environments, particularly African-American neighborhoods. So this was creating a problem of geographic as well as economic access. So lack of access became a watchword of the alternative food movement. And so here you see some interface with the food desert analysis that Michelle Obama helped popularize. An additional critique emerged that upscale alternative, alternative food was not resonating in communities of color. In other words, that it borrowed too heavily on whitened cultural histories, histories and practices. Like the thing that my students love to say is like, I want to put my hands in the soil, when we know that for some people putting their hands in the soil is not a a memory that's uh, a good one. So the food justice movement was born out of these observations. Borrowing from environmental justice activism, food justice activists made two different critiques. One is that they noted that people of color were disproportionately exposed to junk food based on the lack of economic and geographic access. And two, they noted that the food movement primarily appealed to the white and privileged. To address the access problem, food justice organizations set up shop in neighborhoods of color. For instance, they asked liquor stores to feature fresh fruits and vegetables. They developed produce delivery services from nearby organic farms. And they set up farmers markets in some food deserts. To address the cultural issue, they tried to bring foods that were associated with African-American foodways, such as collard greens and melons. And I am particularly focusing on African-American neighborhoods here because they have been the, the, the gotten the lion's share of focus from food activism. 
The activists also tried to encourage people of color to participate and take leadership in these organizations. Now, the results of these efforts were honestly quite mixed. Um, and many residents in so-called food deserts voiced that they really just wanted a supermarket in their neighborhood. Following that trend, the food movement turned to urban farms and community gardens. The idea here was to further close the gap between producer and consumer. And the urban agriculture movement also aspired to create community and provide a safety net when public entitlements are lacking. And research suggests the farms that the farms that have taken hold, the urban farms that have taken hold best are in communities with residents not eligible for public food assistance, such as among recent immigrants, particularly undocumented immigrants. And most recently, food justice activists began to borrow from peasant movements in the developing world and have called for food sovereignty, community control of the food system, and then even more recently borrowed on things like the Occupy movement to do the Occupy the Farm movement. Um, now, I'll just briefly elaborate here. This is an event that took place in, um, in Berkeley, California, where I do happen to live. And um, this, was, this is um, university property. It's a, gil, it's a gill tract, and it's been used as an agricultural experimentation for years. And activists took it over and, as an Occupy the Farm and, and wanted to prevent the university from selling it um, to a land developer who was going to develop a uh, sprout supermarket there, like a, a you know, Whole Foods type supermarket and a senior recreation center. Um, just as an aside, this was the kind of thing that really frustrated me because it seemed to me that what would have been a really a, a more, important, a more important strategy was for them to demand that the University of California change the kind of uh, research it's doing at the Jill Track to, to, to support more sustainable methods, but they wanted to occupy. Anyway. <clears throat> now, let me pause to say that there's a lot that is exciting about all this. Clearly, food activism has galvanized young people in a big way. There are more food initiatives in more cities than we could have possibly imagined 25 years ago. Funders are paying attention, and nonprofits are growing like weeds. And judging by my students, young people are increasingly aware of and concerned about the injustices of industrial food production. And let's face it, there's a lot more good food, and I, for one, really like good food. Yet there are still some serious limits to these approaches. One is that they continue to emphasize the consumption of food, even though some of the worst injustices stem from the production of food. Now, note that over 20 million people work in the food sector in the United States, providing about one-sixth of employment. But people who work in food are some of the most food insecure because of the poor wages in food processing, food service, and farm work. And it's not only the pay. Food workers face really dangerous working conditions, particularly in meat pa packing and sexual harassment. Farm workers face the worst pesticide exposures because many chemicals are formulated with consumer health in mind. And of course, many food and farm workers have very little means to contest these conditions because they're undocumented. So basically, you have an approach to changing the food system that ignores the workforce in the food system. Another limit to this approach is that it promotes alternatives rather than contest what's wrong. So in effect, we're getting a bifurcated food system. We get great food for the well-endowed, well-located, and well-funded, and dregs for the rest, including those who work in the food system. Now, when I've given talks like this, people say, but you have to have alternatives, and you do have to have alternatives. 
you have to have alternatives and opposition. If you oppose industrial agriculture's practices, you need to develop and disseminate safer and less toxic ways of producing food. And indeed, growers are much more willing to move to more sustainable methods when there are viable, viable agronomic tools for, to help them. But with some very small exceptions, the contemporary food movement has focused almost solely on building alternatives. At the same time that community gardens and direct marketing and farming and cooking education programs have proliferated, work on policy and corporate behavior has pretty much dwindled. But that, just recently, is changing. And in my remaining time, I'm going to focus on three examples that respond directly to these critiques. And all, all, all these examples are drawn from the new book, and so I'm drawing on other people's research besides my own. So I'm going to begin here with an alternative, but an alternative that is organized by people of color and sees action as collective rather than individual. And here I'm drawing from research by Allison Alcon and Melisa Fuguera. So this is about Chicago's Healthy Food Hub, and it was established in 2009 with the aim of pooling the resources of its members and surrounding communities, and, and surrounding communities to bring home healthier, tastier, fresher food for less. This is mainly achieved through collective purchasing of wholesale organic pr produce. So it's back to the old collective purchasing model of the 1970s that so thrived in Cambridge, Massachusetts when I visited here then. So, and, they, and they also buy directly from rural farms in the historic black farming community of Pembroke Township, Illinois. This is a, a membership organization. People pay an annual fee of $25 to become a member and then they receive discounts on food products and can uh, pre-order their food. Now what's significant here is that the Healthy Food Hub was not initially conceived as a food justice initiative. It began spontaneously among a group of patients in, in the care of the Hub's founder, an African-American holistic pro practitioner based in South Chicago. She noted that many of her patients' conditions stemmed from poor nutrition. So she expanded what was then her household practice of buying food in bulk to include her patients and their families in order to secure the best quality food for the best available prices. Critically, the strategy of a collective buying club has deep historical roots in long-standing African-American practices of collective survival and resistance. For instance, the Populist Colored Farmers Alliance, Populist Colored Farmers Alliance organized purchasing cooperatives to, quote, resist the power of white creditors, unquote, during Reconstruction. The founders of the Healthy Food Club Hub as well as many of its older members, came to Chicago with their respective families from Mississippi during the 1950s and 60s. And many remember collective food purchasing as a routine family practice. So this shared cultural memory may be one reason why the Hub has been so successful at enrolling and engaging its members while other alternative food organizations working in similar communities have really, quite, have really struggled. Now I'm going to turn to one of several campaigns connected to the Food Chain Workers Alliance, which is a coalition of worker-based organizations who are organizing to improve wages and working conditions for workers along the entire food chain. And this case study comes from Joanne Lowe and Biko Koenig. Now this campaign took place at Taylor Farms, which is based in California's Central Valley. And Taylor Farms is one of the world's largest processors of salads and fresh cut produce. 
selling to retailers such as Walmart, Trader Joe's, and Kroger's. They also sell to Chipotle. Mm -hmm. But because of the anonymity provided by private labels and institutional buyers, Taylor Farms is also a company that exists beyond the influence and even knowledge of most individual consumers. Now, about 900 people, mostly Latino, were working at two different plants in California's Central Valley. Two-thirds of these workers were employed through temporary staffing agencies, even though some of them had been working at Taylor Farms for many years, over a decade. Most were paid the minimum wage, and on average, the workers in, the, in these plants were earning $3 less per hour than their similar workers in this, uh, doing the same job in the Salinas operations of Taylor Farms, which tends to be higher wages in Salinas. And beyond the notoriously poor wages, the company accrued $80,000 in occupational safety and health violations from 2008 to 2013. So in 2013, after months of behind the scenes organizing, workers at the Taylor Farms plants in Tracy, California, that's in the Central Valley, announced they were organizing to join a union. Taylor Farms responded with a variety of union anti-union tactics. On the stick side, these included intimidation, harassment, and mistreatment. For instance, they threatened to call La Migra, immigration, and referred to workers as Latinos de mierda, piece of shit Latinos. And they fired their union supporters. On the carrot side, Taylor Farms made some nominal improvements to working conditions, such as providing sick days, most notably and Gratuitously, the company gave roses to the women on Mother's Day and gave backpacks, jackets, and scarves to the men on Father's Day. Despite the company's anti-union tactics, the worker leaders and the Teamsters organizers were able to collect enough signatures um, on union authorization cards to file for an election through the National Labor Relations Board. However, the process became bogged down and didn't go far. So the campaign turned toward another strategy, utilizing a model embodied in the good food purchasing policy adopted by the city of Los Angeles. The good food purchasing policy sets purchasing guidelines across five key values, local food economies, environmental sustainability, humane animal treatment, healthy nutrition standards, and fair treatment and compensation of food chain workers. The idea here was to leverage purchasing power of institutional buyers rather than through individual fork voting. You've all heard of voting with your fork. The Teamsters went to the Oakland Unified School Board to inform them on what was going on at Taylor Farms. And at that meeting, the Oakland Unified School Board announced that the school district would no longer be buying from Taylor Farms. And this was a loss of a huge contract. Eventually they won a settlement and fired workers received back pay. This last example is based on my own research and concerns thwarting the highly toxic chemical methyl iodide. Methyl iodide was developed and released to be an alternative to methyl bromide. Methyl bromide is an ozone-depleting substance that has been the primary armament of the California strawberry industry's war with soil disease. In the early 2000s, facing the mandated phase-out of methyl bromide, the strawberry industry began looking for a replacement chemical. So University of California researchers developed the compound methyl iodide that was very structurally similar to methyl bromide but lacked the ability to reach the upper atmosphere. And so then they sold the patent of methyl iodide to Arista Life Sciences Corporation. So Arista first sought federal approval for the use of methyl iodide on strawberries in 2002, but 
face some problems. Methyl iodide is apparently much more toxic than methyl bromide. It is a known neurotoxin and carcinogen. It's associated with thyroid dysfunction, respiratory illness, lung tumors, and it's a probable cause of miscarriages and birth defects. It's even used to induce cancer in laboratory rats. Now, I want to emphasize something about these chemical fumigants that are really have motivated my existing research. They are used before planting. They're put in the ground to get, they're, they're fumigated, they're gases. They're put in the ground to get rid of soil disease and, and weeds. They leave no residues on plants, on strawberries. So the people who are most exposed to their toxicity are those who live or work near strawberry fields who don't have the option of buying their way out, by buying an organic strawberry, for instance. Now, early on in this battle, over 50 scientists, several of them Nobel laureates in chemistry, wrote a letter encouraging the US Environmental Protection Agency to deny registration. After some stalling, the EPA eventually allowed the use of methyl iodide. But methyl iodide faced a much tougher fight in California, which has more stringent environmental regulations. There, activist organizations, including anti-pesticide, environmental, public health, and farm worker groups went beyond fork voting, fork voting and mounted a major campaign to prevent the chemical from being registered. The campaign concluded over 53,000 uh, written public comments collected, with almost all but a handful objecting to the use of the chemical. It included media events, it included public hearings, publicizing the chemical's harm. It included picketing besides farmers' fields, although not a lot of that. In addition, activists filed a lawsuit against California's Pesticide Regulatory Agency for failing to abide by envir environmental law in registering the chemical. Long story short, and it is a long story, the chemical was pulled from commercial use because Arista no longer felt it was economically viable. And this is in large part because growers didn't adopt the chemical for fear of public backlash. This was an unprecedented victory, one of the few toxic chemicals that, to be taken off the market in the modern history of US environmental regulation. And since then, the strawberry industry has become much more serious about finding non-chemical alternatives to fumigation than it had previously. Unfortunately, as I'm writing about my current book, it's just not finding an alternative that's going to do it, but that's another story. So what do these campaigns tell us? They tell us it is possible to work in collectives. It is possible to organize. It is possible to be oppositional. It's possible to win. It's possible to have people of color lead, and it's possible to use strategies other than voting with your fork. It's possible to be political. So I want to end by talking a little bit more about the politics of the possible in the age of Trump. Now, many of the arguments and critiques I've developed over the years about food movements have come in conversation with my students. So for the last 14 years, I've been teaching in a program whose core is a six-month full-time field study with a social justice and social change organization. This is a community studies program. Um, and I've been the faculty member who works most closely with students interested in food and agriculture. So I've been able to closely track what kinds of social change opportunities are available and what kind my projects are, excuse me, what kind of projects my students are interested in. Many of my students, to my chagrin, have ended up in projects where the aim is to teach low-income people of color what to eat or how to grow food. That's all that they can think of doing. This is what organizations are doing. 
When I've pressed them on these inclinations and asked why they're not more interested in public action, I've heard many times over that to focus on alternatives is easier and more fun. And even though they are well trained in the political economy of the food system, they have also said that affecting policy or changing corporate behavior seems impossible. But that was before Occupy Wall Street and, Pub and Black Lives Matter, two movements that have changed the public conversation. It was the Occupy movement that brought inequality and the wealth gap back into public discourse. Without Black Lives Matter, we wouldn't have many pe people, including white people, talking about how colorblind activism works to reinscribe white privilege. These recognizable changes in the public conversation are no doubt the very things to which the alt-right movement is reacting. Now, I don't think it's a coincidence that these two movements correspond closely to the critiques of the food movement I've discussed earlier in my talk. That the movement appealed too much to markets and profit making as a way to solve problems. That it's too white. And therefore, these conversations have provided new opportunities for food movements to address some of the underlying causes of food equity, inequities, income and health inequality, insufficient health and safety regulation, immigration policy, regressive taxes, and to show how these are connected. I hate to put this next slide up, but there you have it. And this new, f you can tell me when to just shift to another slide so you don't have to look at it. This new food activism couldn't be more urgent in the age of Trump. Should I go back? You've had enough? I have. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're already witnessing some of the attacks on environmental regulation, including pesticide regulation. The US pesticide regulatory system is far, far, far from perfect, but is, it has played a modest role in preventing toxic exposures to consumers, workers, and others. But Scott Pruitt's EPA suggests huge reversals. Since being appointed, he is set to dismantle the agency's pesticide research apparatus. He's already reversed a ban on chlor chlorpyrifos, a brain-harming agrochemical that was about to be enacted. The, the ban, not the chemical. Trump's immigration policies need no introduction, but building a wall with the southern border and wrapping, ramping up the de deportations that were well underway during the Obama presidency has not only worsened a labor shortage that concerns growers, it has caused the millions of undocumented food and farm workers in the United States to live in constant fear, unable to contest wage theft, pesticide use violations, and sexual harassment and assault that are mainstays of US food and farm work. According to some sources, Trump is threatening to cut more than $190 billion over 10 years from food assistance programs, programs that are already insufficient in ensuring that the country's poor do not go hungry. He's also, also threatening to cut crop insurance and other programs to protect farmers, although these are far more controversial. And he is packing his administration, to the extent, to the extent that he's actually packing his administration, with those who seek no reins on corporate behavior or mergers, clearing the way for even more corporate control of the food system. It's simply not clear to me how individual choices to purchase organic local food at the farmer's market will stop this agenda. I just have to tell this little story. I think I have time. This, the day after the election, when I and many others were nursing our sometimes real and some, or definitely proverbial hangovers, um, I managed to get out of the house and go to the UC 
SC library, I don't know why I went up there, but there in front of the library was someone petitioning, uh, or he, he wasn't petitioning, he had a clipboard and he was signing up people for his, uh, his farm to buy subscriptions to, for, to get food from his farm. It was a classic community supported agriculture. He was, you know, the typical Santa Cruz blonde, dreadlock, sandal wearing guy. Um, uh, this was the day after the Trump election, and I, I mean, to me, this was like so much captured the frustration I have with the alternative food movement. It felt just so irrelevant at that moment. But the good news, as we have seen, is that the public is on to the Trump agenda, and we've seen a lot of resistance and pushback in many different arenas, including those that bear on our food system. And at this point, I don't think we have a choice but to continue on in this vein. So that's what I have to say. I thank you and I welcome your questions and comments. Uh, thank you. It's pretty much, much more complex than I thought it was going to be. In my experience, corporations are willing to change. Uh, John Mackey once was at MIT of uh, Whole Foods. The students are giving him the proverbial hard time, saying, why are you so expensive the poor can't afford it? And his response was, if they eat my food, they won't fall as sick. So in the long run, I'm, they, he said, I failed to convince them, though, to not eat pork ribs and Coke and eat my food. So I admit that failure, but I'm open to any way you can suggest, and nobody really had a suggestion. Uh, when Doug Rock of Whole Foods, I'm um, of uh, Trader Joe's came, he has started something here called, I uh, uh, think, Daily Table. So he said, okay, how do I go to a disadvantaged daily, bring the cost down? So he takes oranges and all that are seconds. We all like perfect oranges, so it's got a blemish on it, you can buy it cheaper. But the jury's still out on it. It's a nonprofit. It's soaked up a lot of money. So it, ultimately, every corporation I talk to says, I cannot convince the Americans to ask for price first. The cheapest banana, the cheapest chicken. So what do you want me to do as a corporation? You have an answer to that? Well, um, there's a few things I want to say. First of all, I do want to say that corporations um, are paying attention to sustainability issues as well. Oh, sorry. Corporations are paying attention to sustainability issues as well. I have a friend here um, who's, uh, she's visiting here in, at Harvard this year who's working on uh, corporate sustainability initiatives. Um, but they're dragged kicking and screaming. I mean, they didn't, they're not doing that out of the goodness of their hearts. I mean, John Mackey, when I first doing my research on organics 20, 25 years ago, he, said, he, he was quoted as saying, so since when is this a movement about social justice? Um, but there is this, um, even though uh, there, corporations are maybe at being at attention, paying attention to prices, I mean, this is the problem with food and agriculture is that you, people talk about, the three pillars of sustainability, or I would say the three things that undermine it, but you have, you know, you have environmental sustainability here, you have farmer incomes here, you have labor issues here, and you have consumer access and accessibility here. These things are, are not well aligned. They are in tension with each other. And in my opinion, the only thing that can kind of make it all work out is, um, is state involvement, because if you have if you have cheaper prices for consumers, then you have poorer conditions and poorer wages for workers. But none of those things, even whatever has happened, none of those things have happened without fights. I mean, that, and that's precisely the point, is because consumers complain in more collectively. Um, but you know, Trader Joe's is a tough one. I mean, Taylor Farms is one of their main suppliers. I think Trader Joe's, uh, their supply chain is not one that's that we sh want, would uh, want to emulate. There's a reason the food is really, really cheap at Trader Joe's. And they, you know, the, the milk they supply comes, you know, people, it's, it's organic milk, but it's coming from farms with, you know, huge feedlots and the, that farm, it's Aurora Dairy, it's more than one farm. Aurora Dairy is, is likely to lose its organic certification, so I hear, so. Hi, um, my name is Danielle. I'm an organizer for Equal Exchange. 
Um, I had kind of a related question about um, specifically the Whole Foods Amazon merger yeah. and kind of that press release that was them really trying to deal with food access and making those products more accessible to yeah. lower income and what your thoughts and reactions on one, that merger, and then secondly, that press release that talks about food access specifically in that context. Um, well, that merger is distressing to me because, you know, it, I, I'm not, I'm not a small is better person. I, don't, I actually think that super small businesses work at some disadvantage. I think that there's some ways in which if we looked at more mid-scale operations, we could do more of this collective buying practices. But, you know, any corporation that big of, of Amazon and Whole Foods is a really frightening thought to me. Um, uh, you know, the accessibility thing with Whole Foods is, is you know, it's another one of these double-edged swords. And, and this goes back to this other question before. I once walked into the um, Whole Foods in Berkeley, California, and um, there was a handwritten sign on the cash, cash, cash register that says, bring in your, uh, your um, damaged canned goods and we'll give it to the, the Alameda County Food Bank. And I'm like, wait a minute. So... We're shopping here at Whole Foods, and like the poor people get our damaged, non-organic goods at the food. I mean, there's something fundamentally wrong with this. Some of the, the kind of food recovery efforts really disturb me because it, it's again reinforcing that so, the wealthy and privileged and the well-located get the good stuff, and everybody else gets the, the handouts. And there's something fundamentally wrong with that. So that's my reaction. Hi, my name is Leron Mintz, um, and you'll. Have to excuse me. I don't normally like fan out about um, people, but uh, you were saying about um, your writing has really informed a lot of activists. And weighing in is probably like the most marked book on my bookshelf that's mm -hmm. like held dear to me. And, uh, I started reading this new book, and I, I do highly recommend it. So I'll shamelessly plug for you. Uh, oh, um, thank you. And I just. One thing that I, I see in your writing to some extent, but I think I, I'm still grappling with and I, I'm wondering if you have some, some ideas about, is that I think there's also an element of self-gratification with food activism. You know, we want to buy a product and feel good about it because then that's something we'll all enjoy, but then it's also something that's saving the world. Or we want to donate to the food bank because that's easy and then we can feel good about it. Um, but it's not that lasting change. And I think with a lot of social movements, it's that challenge. You're gonna have to grapple with, with questions of like white power. Um, you have to grapple with your own privilege and you have to get out of a comfort zone to then go into that political sphere, which I think a lot of people have a hard time doing or they find that that uh, easy answer checks off enough of that mental checklist in their brain they don't have to move into that, that political sphere. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's a really, really tough question, and I grapple with it personally all the time. I know somebody's going to ask me if I eat organic food, and, by eat, and somebody will ask me that, so I'll just say, yes, I do. Um, and I just, I just think that, you know, I, as I tell my students, sometimes you have to live with contradiction. But I think that there's something about the food movement in particular that well, we know what it is about the food movement because food is what sustenance and food is pleasure. And there's so, so there's something about that food movement where that contradiction comes to a head. I mean, no one, you know, while it, it may be fun to, um, oh, I have, I still have Black Lives Ladder, Matter on the screen. You have strawberries. Um, <laughs> it may be fun and to attend a rally or a march at, which may or may not be all that effective, but it may be fun, but it's not, it's not what's motivating you. But with food movements, it's what's motivating you. And I think that's why so much food movements have been about teaching people how to eat because, oh, I have, I have the pleasures of eating, you know, like Alice Waters of Chez Panisse tells me to with my organic kale with lots of garlic and salt and olive oil. So let me tr teach you about it too. Let me share the pleasure with you. And I think that it's about, it's because of the, food itself that kind of gets that mo the movement into that very contradictory place of pleasure and action. Um, and I don't know that there's any way around that. Um, but I do think it's unique. And I don't know if that gets to your question, but... Um, Good effort. Okay. <laughs> 
Hi, thank you so much for speaking. I wanted to pick up on a point that you'd made earlier about how some of your students have this tendency to want to, you know, go out and teach poor people how to cook, you know, which might be well-intentioned but um, sort of misguided. And I wanted to get your thoughts on something because I, I do think that people of all economic backgrounds, you know, do rely too much on processed food, fast food, and it's detrimental to everyone's health. I think it can also be detrimental to sort of our sense of culture and just general empowerment in your life. And I think that, you know, a lot of that, you can trace that back to systemic issues. We phased out home ec in schools, for example. Right. And so right. I guess I'm just wondering if you have thoughts on how to address um, sort of the cooking side of it from more of a systemic issue instead of just these, you know, let's do little workshops and teach poor people how to cook. Yeah, no, that's, that's another kind of a biting question here. I, um, <laughs> I was at a, I'm sorry, all these stories keep popping into my brain, but I was at this um, book fair in Los Angeles and I was speaking about my book and I had, there was a, a f author of a, a, a cookbook. She says, if all we need to do is teach people how to make vine vinaigrette. <laughs> <laughs> um, the cooking thing is an interesting one, right? And Michael Pollan and others have written about, you know, that we need, you know, that we need to get <laughs> kind of back to the kitchen. Um, and there's, I like cooking. Cooking's a good thing, but I I still think there's this fun. You know, the why do why do people not cook? Yeah, maybe they love the Jack in the Box, but you know, I mean, when, when you have people with two jobs, they're single parents, they're picking up the. I mean, let's get real here about the cooking thing. So I I think it's nice to cook. I you know I'd like to. I, I, ultimately, I think people could eat more nutritiously and possibly cheaper, not super cheap if with cooking, but you have to face the real obs the real obstacles to cooking. But I think that's a different issue than like this kind of proselytizing about cooking. And for me, that when my students are picking up on that is that they it's been more that they can't imagine what else is possible to, to change the food system. Now they they can more, but that's where they were about 10 years ago. Well, what else are we going to do? I go, well, look, here's this great organization that does gr great anti-pesticide work. Well, I don't want to sit behind a desk. You know, I don't want to be in a computer. So the, sometimes that pleasure really can, I, I don't mean, excuse me, sometimes that pleasure can really get in the way of, you know, what, what's important, you know? I mean, if, if we think of other kind of uh, important moments of our time, important activism, I mean, um, you wouldn't, uh, I'm just trying to think of an, uh, some analogous situation if you were concerned about Syrian refugees, for example. You, I don't, you wouldn't, I don't know, I can't think of the analogous situation where you say, well, I want to do this because it's more fun, you know? So there's some, again, there's something about the food movement that puts us in that, like, well, I want to just have fun while I'm doing this. Hi, um, my name is Rachel and I'm a student at the School of Public Health here um, and I had a question on, you described the current pessimistic political climate and also a lot about what bothers you, what people do around food activism, but under the assumption that everybody here is interested in food activism and wants to take action, what do you, rem what do you recommend as next steps for when we leave this room? Like, Is there anything concrete you can think of to do in our daily lives that would really help? Well, you know, there are, um, not many, but there are good organizations that do good mm -hmm. work, um, the, the organizations that do pesticide activism that, uh, um, often, you know, some of them have letter writing campaigns. You can join one of those and get on their listservs. It's always better to write um, individual notes than just do the clicktivism. But, you know, there, like for instance, right now, Pesticide Action Network has, um, working hard to, to, to put that chlor, chlorpyrifos ban back in place. So you have to get on the listservs, you have to write letters, but it, it worked on this methyl iodide campaign. So that's you know one place you can go. The farm bill should be coming up soon, and I expect to see um, the Trump administration come up with a really nasty one. Um, and there will be many organizations that will be working on that. Um, so whether you only can write your letter, but an individualized letter, or give a hundred bucks, that's something. Or you know, if you're um, uh, a student and you're looking to 
employ yourself later. You can get you can intern and get involved in work. But I, I those things do exist. Um, or you know, working on you know, there's so many. You know, how you work on immigration reform is a tough one, right? I mean, whether you're um, or immigration reform or immigration, whether you're like leaving plastic jugs of water in the desert in Arizona or, you know, again, lobbying your congressperson about a, a safer, a better immigration bill, you know, those are different options. But there, there's lots. But they're not like, they're not always as tangibly about food. And I think that's one of the things too, is that, is that the, the policies that I think impinge on the food system are not always about that material thing called food. They're about the systems that grow, are around it. Hi, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm Nicole Hoche. I'm a Harvard Extension um, Sustainability Master's student. Um, and my question, or um, two issues that that we, two of our biggest global issues, is soil security and soil fertility, as well as the food waste that we throw away. So in developed countries, we're throwing, we're sending about 40% to landfill. Um, so my question is. Um, is there or should there be discussions around a cradle-to-grave initiative for the agriculture sector? Um, and does this present any opportunities to resolve any of the issues that you've discussed with us today? Um, food waste is a tricky one. Um, you know, I think food waste is a a huge aesthetic problem. No one likes to see food waste. Um, most of the food waste, and this isn't answering your question directly, it's just what I know about. Most of the food waste initiatives are really geared toward consumers, like, you know, here's how to reuse that, or use that kale that's been sitting there for in your drawer for three weeks. Most of the food waste occurs in agricultural production, um, and lots of it. And it's, Yes, there are organizations that do food recovery, you know, whether it's organizing gleaning, but the, our food production system is geared to create food waste. It's profitable to create food waste. So again, it's a matter of figuring out ways to address how food is produced through policy and you know, and through somehow changing up the incentives, so corporate farming or, or it's not only corporate farming, individual farmers just don't don't leave so much food on the field. Um, but you know, your question also brings us to bigger questions about what is the nature of hunger and if it's about insufficient food production. I, I, I'm concerned about food waste because you don't want to see soil go to waste. You don't want to see animal lives put down for, no, for nothing. Um, but I'm always worried about food recovery as a way to address it. And that's about as much as I can say about it at this point, because it's not something I've looked at a lot. Thank you, Julie. That was fantastic. Um, join me in uh, congratulating her for a stimulating.